of the University of Tennessee Libraries to a truly unique event. I'm Stephen Smith, Dean of Libraries here at the University of Tennessee. Five years have passed since catastrophic wildfires swept through parts of Sevier County and the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, destroying woodlands, wildlife, homes, and businesses, and taking the lives of 14 people. To anyone in our audience who lost property, who was injured, or who experienced the loss of a loved one, we express our sorrow and condolences for your loss. Healing from such a tragedy is a long process. There were many victims and many heroes on November 23rd, 2016, the days uh, after that tragic event. Recording the experiences of those who lived through the tragic events of that day and commemorating the heroism and compassion um, was the objective of Rising from the Ashes, an oral history project of the University of Tennessee Libraries with support from the city of Gatlinburg and partnership from the Anna Porter Public Library. Drawing inspiration from the interviews recorded by this project, Rising from the Ashes, our guests this evening, illustrators Paige Braddock, Marshall Ramsey, Danny and Danny Wilson have used their skills as graphic artists to further document the experiences of those who were impacted by these events. If you would like to see, listen, and read the interviews of those uh, individuals who were gathered as part of this project, the residents, emergency responders, volunteers, scientists, medical professionals, and others, and the stories that inspired our artist, you can visit the Rising from the Ashes website at the link provided uh, with the URL as you see it on the screen before you. Rising from the Ashes, the Chimney Tops 2 Wildfires in Memory and Art will be a catalog featuring the creative responses of our artist, along with text by naturalist and Gatlinburg native Stephen Lynn Bales, which is forthcoming from the University of Tennessee Press. This work, as well as the production of a forthcoming digital exhibit, has been generously supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts and specifically their Our Town program, which funds projects that strengthen communities through artistic and creative engagement. This evening's panel is also generously supported through this program, as will be future events and activities. We are grateful that the National Endowment for the Arts recognize the importance of this project and provided support for the artist work. One of these artists, Marshall Ramsey, will serve as our moderator this evening. Marshall is a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist whose cartoons and illustrations are syndicated nationally and whose artwork, stories, and posts are frequently shared on social media. By the way, Marshall got his start right here at the University of Tennessee working for the Daily Beacon. Marshall is editor at large for Mississippi Today, a nonpartisan nonprofit news and media company. He also hosts a weekly radio program and a television program, Conversations on Mississippi Public Broadcasting. I am pleased to turn this evening's program over to our very capable moderator, Marshall Ramsey, and Marshall will have the honor of introducing his fellow panelists. Thank you, Marshall. Thank you, Steve. I tell you what, um, I'm really proud to introduce uh, my my uh, uh, fellow illustrators that are so incredibly talented. Number one is uh, Paige Braddock. And she's best known for Eisner-nominated comic strip, Jane's World. It's the first gay-themed comic work to receive online distribution by a national media syndicate in the U.S. Braddock concluded the comic strip after completing its 20-year run in 2018. And to celebrate the groundbreaking comic's 20th anniversary, she released a special anthology with Lion Forge in August 2018, Letters to Jane's World. 2019, it was selected as the Lambda Literary Finalist for Best LGBTQ Graphic Novel. Braddock published the first novel inspired by a comic series in 2016 with Bold Strokes Books. She has also written a series of lesbian romance novels with this publisher under the pen name Missouri Vaughn. Two of her novels won Golden Crown Literary Society Awards in 2019. She, of course, works with Schultz Enterprises. I'm very envious for her on that. I grew up wanting to draw Snoopy, and by God, she gets to do it every day, and I'm pretty impressed with that as well. And also, too, Danny Wilson's joined us. He's a freelance illustrator based in Knoxville. 
Uh, for almost 40 years, he has built a reputation for versatility, illustrating many different styles and genres. And he primarily works as a digital concept artist for event and experience. I can't even speak English today. Uh, marketing as well. He has created work for Disney, Warner Brothers, Netflix, Amazon, Walmart, Coca-Cola, HDTV, Taylor. Okay, Taylor Swift. All right, I can't compete with that, Danny. You win on that one <laughs> as well. You've done several posters. You did the 2016 Battle for a Bristol poster, which is pretty cool. He does a lot of stuff for the University of Tennessee as well. Uh, Danny graduated from the University of Tennessee in 1984 with a BFA degree. We met last week. Uh, up in Knoxville, and it was really cool to get to meet you and your wife, Jennifer, and that was a real thrill as well. And I personally hope that working on this project means that both of your talent rubbed off on me a little bit because you're both incredible. So, oh, Thank you, Marshall. That was a very nice introduction. Oh, that was a very highly caffeinated introduction, and I just thought <laughs> y'all would enjoy that. I didn't want to take up the That's whole caffeine hour. right here. <laughs> yeah, I, I seriously thought about just reading the bios for the whole hour because I pretty much could have covered your whole life, maybe. <laughs> hour both of you have had an incredible career let's just go ahead and get started with this question um what's your connection to the smokies um and some of your favorite memories and so forth and what was your reaction of the day and the night that the fire swept down off the mountain and into gatlinburg because i know mine and we'll go ahead and start with you danny well, my connection with, uh, with the smokies as I, I grew up in east tennessee grew up in elizabethan so uh, coming to the Smokies, coming to Gatlinburg uh, was uh, a lot of times part of family vacations, family trips. Um, as I started a family, uh, you know, we would take trips into Gatlinburg. We were hiking in the Smokies, driving around Cades Cove, all those things that that people that visit the Smokies love to do. You know, as a kid going to Gatlinburg, I remember looking in the windows at the candy stores. One thing I really I loved uh, Ripley's, believe it or not. But the thing I really remember is I would look in the art galleries and I would watch the airbrush t-shirt artists, which fascinated me. So I have a lot of good memories from Gatlinburg as a kid. And then as a parent also we'd take our boys skiing up there and things like that. But as far as the, um, you know, the fire, when I guess I was aware that it, there was a fire and kind of keeping uh, kind of in the peripheral vision, kind of keeping up with it. But and then just watching the news and thinking, wow, that's, you know, there was a lot of discussions about how did it start and all those things. But then just being really, um, really shocked at how it spread so quickly and the the scope of it and the amount of damage and devastation that happened. Uh, so, um, you know, from then it was just keeping up with it on the on the local news following uh, certain stories. I remember the, the fellow that was searching for his family members. Yeah. Um, you know, they interviewed uh, some of the footage they would show at the, how uh, big the flames were and talking about how the wind had picked up so much and made it spread so fast. So those are the things I remember just uh, kind of keeping up with it on the side. And then all of a sudden just being shocked at what actually happened and hearing the amount of damage that had been done. Yeah, yeah, I grew up um, in Atlanta. My family's from Maryville, uh, believe it or not. And I've got this wonderful picture of my grandparents. And I, I, we think it's from the early 30s. It's before they got married. Yeah, they're sitting there right in front of the chimney, right where the fire started. That's my grandfather and my grandmother. Um, in fact, that's the same grandparents that my cousin Dave Ramsey and I share right there, if you ever hear him talking about them. But yeah, I mean, the Smokies were always a huge part of my life growing up because I would come up to Tennessee during the summer and my grandparents would take me to Gatlinburg. And I remember when I brought my own kids up to the candy store and they were making taffies. And I was telling my, my kids, I said, you know, when I was your age, he, he, I used to watch this guy make taffy. And the guy looked at me and went, that was me. <laughs> you know, it was like 30 <laughs> something years later. I'm like, man, you've been here this whole time. But uh, the, we have a little cabin uh, out toward Cobbling Knob, actually, on the Cock County Severe line. And so when the fire hit, you know, my sister and my aunt had been up there right before, and they were just telling me how incredibly dry it was, and they were predicting high winds. And But I never expected the fire to spread quite like it did. Um, I'd lived out in San Diego. Paige lives out in California. And I mean, when you see the fires out West, they're, they're just terrifying. You know, they travel so fast and you see the people that can't outrun them and everything. But usually Eastern fires are not that bad. But I just remember sitting up all night on social media watching 
this going on. I watched Russell Bivens uh, report. In fact, I even did a drawing based on him. Um, just how passionate everybody was reporting on that night. And it was just terrifying. I thought Gatlinburg was gone. And so it was, um, it was just really a, an emotional thing. And, you know, I've been in Mississippi for 25 years, but it was just so many people here vacation there. And it's just, it's amazing how many people are in the country love the Smokies. And I think that played in down the, the line for how much help came, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Paige, um, I know you, like I said, fires are not one of your favorite things because you've lived in a place that's been ravaged by them. So it had to be tough for you to sit there and watch all that happen. Yeah, well, it's uh, like you're saying, your experiences in San Diego, like we have a fire season out here. And, you know, as frightening as they are, they not that you get used to them, but you see fire in California. You see fires in the Pacific Northwest and in the West. And that I was so I think I think when I first heard about the fire in Gatlinburg, I wasn't I was like sort of in disbelief. Right. I had to like go yeah. online and start like you, like watching social media to find out what was going on. And um, I still have friends there from when I went to college in the area. So I'm, you know, of course, texting them and finding out if they're OK. And, you know, uh, yeah. And then I'm just sort of glued to all the, the photojournalism coming out of there because you just sort of couldn't believe, as Danny said, the scale of it. Um, I don't know. Just I, it was just sort of surprising. And then it, that happened in 2016 and then 2017, where I live in Santa Rosa, we had um, a huge fire um the tubs fire that burned like just so many homes so it was weird it was like a weird sort of you know one big fire in an area you love and then the very next year another big fire in an area you love um very sobering well i think that that's a good place to jump into the research and you know i mean for me and of course i you know i me and the, when they said, well, you know, do all these hours of research and everything. And, and I had back surgery, which I will use. I'll, I'll go ahead and get that out here right now because I'll talk about that all day long. That's, that's one of my favorite topics. But I started getting intimidated by it a little bit. And but then once I got into it, I couldn't stop watching the videos and, and because the stories were so incredibly powerful. Paige, we'll go ahead and get started with you on this. When you're watching those videos and here you had gone through that. Um, personally, and I know you get out of Dodge a lot of times during fire season because you don't want to deal with that. Was that triggering in any way for you when you're sitting here hearing these stories that you had literally just lived a couple of years ago? It was an interesting process, and I think maybe I was a little afraid to hear some of the stories in the beginning, right? You sort of have to, uh, you know, <laughs> get your courage up. Uh, it We had a very scary experience um, two years ago where we got trapped on I-80 when the fire crossed, it jumped the freeway and burned and killed a couple of people in Fairview. Anyway, it just, it like happened at Fairfield. It happened like so fast and um, we were sort of trapped in our cars. And now literally I smell smoke and I have a, a physical reaction, like my heart rate will jump up. And, and so listening to these stories and um, uh, there were a couple in particular where it, it was like, I could feel like, the the sort of what these people were feeling the fear and the sort of the uncertainty and you're trying to get good information you're trying to figure out which which routes of escape are open like all that stuff um came back as i was listening to these stories um it's interesting to to hear them because people would sort of start slow in their interviews they would be sort of formal and then they would sort of warm up and just be really honest about what they were feeling. And you're really drawn into their personal experiences. Some of them were really powerful. Definitely. Danny. Yeah. Um, I would say the same thing. Very powerful stories. Listen to just um, the emotion in people's voices. Uh, even this long after the event, um, you know, things like people not knowing if their home was still standing and they weren't allowed to go in. There was a lot of that. In, in a lot of the interviews, uh, people, uh, because the lines of communication were down, people not able to um, uh, reach loved ones for periods of time. So a lot of it was just really heartbreaking. People, uh, talking, people talking about the, the particular things about their home that they lost or when they did get to go to the site, uh, stories like, uh, my home was standing, but all my neighbor's homes were burned. And, yeah. and really... Um, crazy mix of emotions about things like that. Um, there were also 
you know, a lot of the stories, I think, um, to the people's credit, a lot of hope in, in their, um, the way they looked at it, uh, the, the ways they were able to start rebuilding, the, the fact that they were thankful um, for the way they had come through it. And then something I found interesting was the stories from some of the research scientists uh, after the fact, even though all of them made it very clear, they said, we really, you know, we wish this hadn't happened, but it did happen. And it's presented some research opportunities that have never been available in the Smoky Mountains before because there had never been a fire like this in the Smoky Mountains. So I thought that was very interesting hearing uh, the kind of some of the things that were good things that were coming out of a tragic event. Yeah, this was my second rodeo when it came to covering a disaster back in 2005 when Hurricane Katrina slammed onto you know New Orleans and the Mississippi Gulf Coast. I went down there to work quite a bit and I went down there to do some drawings and those drawings were the second time I was a Pulitzer finalist, which uh, is a nice way of saying I lost, but I was close. Uh, but but the, the thing that fascinated me about the research was hearing the voices of resilience and how the community came together, the whole mountain strong concept, mm. how everybody pulled together. And, and I'll, talk about this again when we talk about our favorite pieces, because, um, you know, here I am, I'm completely, you know, recovering from surgery. I'm sitting there getting sucked into these interviews and there there's stories like, you know, literally grabbing your boy scout knife at the last second, as you're walking out the door into this hellscape and you're going down the hill and there's a tree over the power lines and you get out and you start cutting off the limbs one by one by one to raise it up enough to get your car out. And because there's somebody behind you who's able to save their grandmother. I mean, there were so many cases like that you hear where the fact that 14 souls lost their life, it could have been so much higher. There were just so many people because they took a right instead of a left. And you hear those stories. But the one story that, that really got to me and, um, deeply is Bob Sweeney's um, video and his thing, because number one, here's a guy. And, and like I said, I'll probably go more into it when we talk about the ind individual drawings, but he literally lost everything. He and his wife, Stephanie, and she's got a, a wonderful video as well. They wanted to live the mountain lifestyle style in Gatlinburg. And they were in the process of moving out there and he wasn't there and she was there and she had a foresight when the smoke got to get out of Dodge, but they lost everything. And, you know, here's this image, which I ended up drawing um, of him praying in the middle of these still hot ashes because he's so grateful his family's OK. You know, and the spoiler alert on this is that I'm sitting here watching this thing and he's talking about all this positivity and how it's changed his life and how he he's he helped all these other people and everything else. So I do due diligence and Google him and he died. He died like last July just drop dead. And I'm like, no. I mean, so I felt like that I got to know some of these people. And so I reached out to his son and his son gave me the photograph that I based the drawing on. But it just, like I said, the, the, the actual research was so incredibly moving. Um, you know, I mean, it was, it was hard and y'all are so incredibly visual about this. And I, I'll go back through on this. Were there times when you're watching or you're watching these that you just go ahead and the images are already in your head. I mean, I don't even think it was work. I mean, I just kind of was jotting notes saying, okay, this is what I'm going to draw right here with arrows pointing toward it. Yeah. I've got sketches along with my notes that I was taking uh, that you can't hardly really read because I was trying to write so fast, but there's also little thumbnail sketches among those as well. Trying to, as images popped into my head. Yeah. yeah I think I was originally, I originally had this thing, this idea that, I might even try to do like a full page, almost sequential kind of comic book style rendering to go with each story. And then, and then I ended up just deciding that I wanted to do images that, that sort of captured the feeling, like, mm -hmm. like the main feeling I got from the interview. So then I ended up just, you know, sort of centering on one image, but like you guys are saying, like, as you were listening, an image would clearly sort of present itself and I would just thumbnail it, you know, and then go back to it later and uh, see if I could make it into a, a decent composition. Yeah, Paige, um, I think you touched on something pretty interesting. And, I, and if you look at the whole body of all of our cartoons together, I think they tell a really do a good job telling the story as a whole. But I think we all kind of came at it from different angles. And you and Danny are both such 
fantastic artist. And I mean, I think your visuals are so incredibly strong. And I'm sitting there writing all of these captions on there. I'm sitting there writing a book, you know, under each cartoon because I did it probably a little bit, a little bit warrior on that. When I saw your captions, though, I was like, oh, I should have done that. I wish I'd done that because, you know, <laughs> so well, we, all, I think we, that, all are, we all are envious of each other's approach to the project, I think. I think so too. I mean, that was the thing I, you know, and I got at it, I got a late start. So y'all had already kind of gotten started on it. And I saw yours before I even started mine. And I was like, well, this is not fair that I've gotten, you know, to be able to take a peek at what you've done. But I guess because I'm so used to, and I have to really talk myself out of this when I'm drawing editorial cartoons of not explaining what I just drew. You know, it's like, okay, I'm probably a better artist than that a little bit, but um, and I, I guess this is probably a good time for us to start talking about the drawings and, and we can talk about some other things too a little bit, but, you know, on the images and, and as I say, well, Paige, we'll go ahead and get started with you on it, on, on some of your favorite drawings and tell us a little bit about what you were motivated by and, and what came to mind when you were drawing them. Okay. Uh, well, I, I guess the first one was the one, I think the one I highlighted has a dog, a, a pet in the image. Yeah, yeah. that one. Um, I mean, the story that originally inspired this image was Becky Jackson's story. Um, and and it was because she, she was at work and heard about the fire and was trying to get her husband to leave. Uh, he was still at their house. She couldn't get to the house. Um, and the way she got him to leave was because she was worried about the dogs, the pets. So she got him to bring the pets down, but it ended up like saving his life. But there were a lot of people that talked about their animals. And I have dogs that I just like are like members of the family. And um, it's very stressful in an evacuation situation to deal with pets and pets get left behind. And it's super heartbreaking. And we actually had a local individual here who went back to get her pets and didn't make it back out. I mean, those stories happen all the time. And there were some stories similar to that in the Gatlinburg fire too. So I think I was trying to capture just the, um, the urgency and the fear and the, you know, imminent danger with this one image of the, the dog with the flames reflected on its face. One of the stories that I heard the woman knew that the fire was getting closer because her cat was sitting next to the uh, the vent by the door because the cat could smell the smoke coming in. And that inspired her to leave. And I was just like, wow, listen to your pets. You know, sometimes they're smarter than we are. Um, and then one of the other images, um, I was going to look at my notes to see uh, the name. Char this was from Charlie Anderson's interview. Yeah. Um, you know, this is this was very similar. This is a long line of cars leaving down basically a back dirt ro dirt road. Yeah. And this is something that happens a lot in where I live in California. We're in the wine country. We have a lot of people who come here who, who aren't familiar with the area. And I think the same thing happened in the Gatlinburg fire. And I heard a couple of interviews to that effect where you've got, as you said, Marshall, people go there to vacation, but maybe they don't know all the back roads and the ins and outs. Mm -hmm. And um, this story was about one of the local young guys like leading a whole line of like tourists basically out of back road in his pickup truck and it saved all these people by getting them out of a road that mm -hmm. they would have never known to go down because the main road was blocked. So those kind of scary stories about, um, you know, when you're in a rural area, more mountainous, narrow two lane roads, which is, you know, similar to here, like evacuation is, is hard. Um, I can't remember which, I think the other image I picked was the one of the, maybe the playground. Um, it's the swing set. This was, um, Leslie Ackerson was a reporter and she was talking about the sort of um, eerie beginning stages when the fire was just getting going and no one really understood the scope of it. And nobody was, the kids weren't allowed to play outside because the air was so full of smoke. And so I just thought, oh, there's nothing more haunting than empty playground equipment, right? Because of some uh, environmental disaster. Uh, so I think that's why I settled on that image. And then I think uh, maybe one of the other ones I highlighted had a piano in it. Um, yeah, this was also from Leslie's reporting. She had a lot of good, just as a, mm -hmm. 
person sort of um, watching everything go down. And she was saying she was watching all these people like load their cars. And, you know, it is a very uh, surreal experience to pack up what are what. So it's like, take all your valuables. Well, when it comes right down to it, what is valuable to you? What is what holds meaning? It's your it's not actually money, right? It's your grand your great granddad's pocket watch that he used when he was on the train. It's like um, a dish that belonged to your mother. You know, it's like all these really. I've been through this, so I'm, I'm just going to tear up even talking about it. But people talking about the things like photographs, things you can't replace, like your photo of your your grandparents. You know what I mean? Like. Um, those things end up, you sort of go through this path of um, realizing what has true value to you. And a lot of these interviews had that sort of thing. And she was watching some woman who really wanted to save her piano and couldn't because it was like the most important, you know, one of the most important things to her. So anyway, just, uh, yeah, it's really hard to talk to, you know, to hear people talk about the things that are irreplaceable, they lost that are really, um, have high sentimental value, not monetary value, I guess. You know, it, I listened to Charlie Anderson's also, his interview. And number one, he kind of reminded me of my dad. So I kind of got sucked into it just for that reason. But here he's yeah. a guy that had, had, had literally built this beautiful resort and thrown his whole life into something. And, you know, and, but the way he handled it and the way he was able to take care of his employees and, mm-hmm. you know, and he since passed away also on that. Oh, I didn't know that. That's yeah, really which, sad. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, like Cindy Ogle's husband, Bud, passed away. And I mean, there's so many people that since the fire have, have, have we've lost. But, you know, that was, um, I mean, like I say, I loved all of your pieces on that. And it's really kind of cool to get to hear some of the stories, what caused you to to pick that idea and to draw that. Danny, on yours, um, yours were like like pages, so incredibly visual and so vivid. Um, you you kind of like what I could imagine what it looked like is what your drawings ended up what they looked like. Well, thanks. So the way I approach this, well, when I was asked to participate, my my first question was, uh, is it okay if I work digitally? Because I know you guys were using real pen and ink and watercolor, and I've been working digitally for a long time, and that was kind of a criteria that I needed to have to be able to pull this off. So all of my drawings are digital. They're digital paintings where I work Mm -hmm. on a, a digital tablet in Photoshop. Um, and, uh, so the way I decided to approach it is, uh, I used to do a lot of magazine illustrations. So I decided like when I would do a magazine illustration, I would get an advanced copy of the article and I would read through it and find little, uh, phrases that prompted some kind of visual in my mind. So I did that same thing when listening to the interviews and then I would, uh, base my sketches off of those things that, that were in the content. So, um, and, and with a magazine illustration, it, uh, it was meant to uh, hint at what's in the content, but maybe not tell the whole story. So that's kind of the way I approach these. Um, I guess the first one I'd like to talk about was called Lone Cabin. I mentioned this earlier about how um, there was a lady, I think her name was Frances. She and her husband, uh, they lost their home. And, you know, after a few days, they were able to go in. They lost their home, but they also owned a rental cabin further up the mountain. And then when they went up to it, it was still standing untouched. And mm. all the other homes around it had burned. So that was kind of the inspiration for that, uh, that image right there. Uh, another one uh, was a, uh, an animal story, like Paige talked about, uh, about a particular cat named Topper that was mentioned by a couple of different um, workers from the UT vet clinic where a lot of the animals, I think there were maybe around 20 animals that had been injured, that had been rescued from the fire that were brought to the UT vet hospital. But Topper was the most injured, I think of all that came in and they, both the people that mentioned him talked about what a fighter he was and and what a trooper he was. And, and he had been separated from uh, his owner. And I think she saw him on when his picture was posted on Facebook and she had lost her home and everything. And they talked about the reunion of when she came to pick up Topper. But as as far as that image, I didn't want, when I just had a drawing of Topper in there, it didn't seem to tell the whole story. So I added two people's hands, two of the workers into the picture 
to just to talk about the people who gave uh, who spent so much time and care caring for these animals. And that seemed to tell the whole story a little bit better than just showing uh, Topper like I first intended to. Uh, another one is, was, um, it's called Motorcycle. This was from Buddy McLean's interview and he owned um, the lodge at Buckberry Creek, uh, which was mostly burned. But he said that the, the last two people to leave that night was, I think, a chef and an, uh, a manager. And he had a, the chef had a motorcycle. He didn't want to leave there. And she had stayed behind so they could leave together. And he wanted to get his motorcycle. And when they came down the mountain, it was basically flames on both sides. Oh. And that image to me, I don't know if you, you guys saw the, uh, in the days following the fires, there was a video, a YouTube video posted mm -hmm. by somebody who had driven out through that. That was the inspiration visually for that illustration because that was one of the most terrifying things I've ever watched, watching that video. Um, let's see, there's one called Kindness of Strangers that I did. This came up in, a, in so many interviews, people just talking about the community how the community surrounded them, you know, how churches for people they didn't know came and brought food and water and clothing and, and hugged them and prayed with them. And uh, so that came, that was seemed to be a thread through so many of the interviews. Uh, so that I did this illustration just to try to capture uh, one of those moments, uh, people uh, reaching out to strangers and, and loved ones just to help comfort them. And then um one of the, uh, uh, they had us, had me do, uh, listen to some interviews with the Hispanic community, which they thought had been, maybe not been represented enough. So they went back and, and got some additional interviews. And one of those uh, was a lady named Julia Rodriguez. And she told this story about a friend of hers who had evacuated and had, had gathered all their things, but forgot her Bible. And her Bible was where she kept her savings. She kept her money in that Bible and she just left and forgot it because it was so in all the chaos of trying to evacuate her family. So that's what this image um, was based on. And then um, I've got one more that uh, was kind of when I talked about the research, um, there's one called Table Mountain Pines. And this was from one of the researchers from UT talked about just the, the life starting to sprout and come back to life uh, after the fires uh, and the hope that that brings and also just the new phases of research that they were able to cultivate uh, through that. So those are some of the ones I picked out as kind of my favorite ones that I did through the listening to those interviews. Yeah, I agree with you about that video, uh, watching that of those guys trying to get down the mountain. I, I just, it was like scarier than any movie that I think I'd ever seen because it was real, you know. And, yeah. and you realize that scene had been played out over and over and over by so many people. And I remember going to parties up in Chaletville. You could go up in the hills for parties in some of those condos. And I mean, I couldn't get out of there when it wasn't on fire. And I can't even imagine trying to do that when you literally, uh, to quote Eric Doble, uh, that works as an illusionist at the Space Needle. He said, it looked like a cartoon hell, you know, mm -hmm. and so, uh, which I thought was the line of the year on that one. And, when, and I, that was one of my drawings too. But yeah, I don't, I don't see how they got down out of the hills um, on that. So, um, you know, my drawings, and, and there were individual stories and people, and part of me is like, I'm sitting there illustrating this and I'm thinking, is it okay for me to tell this story? Is it okay? Is it getting too personal? It's like, like, like Bob's story, you know, and telling that um, Russell Bivens story really jumped out at me because it, when I was down covering, you know, and, and I didn't cover Katrina initially, but I went down there and worked quite a bit and was down there a lot. And the destruction was so overwhelming that when I would get home, I would have literally nightmares about what I'd saw, seen down on the coast. And Russell really is very passionate in his interview talking about how, um, you know, it, it completely, you know, he had covered Katrina, so he had seen that destruction too. But when it happens in your home, you know, people that you love and you're seeing this happen, it's like he drove home every night to just go home and hug his feelings. And he got tired. They just told him finally, go home, get some rest, because you don't even realize that the people that are covering it too are getting completely worn out too. And I thought that was a strong story. Um, Charlie Anderson's uh, story, and I don't know if I included that drawing or not. I can't remember what I 
<laughs> what I turned in to, to show. Um, his story was really, you know, here he is looking at the ruins of, of what he'd built his whole life. And that was strong. Eric Dobles, and I think I did include that one of the cartoon hell uh, drawing. He literally opened up his front door and there's nothing mm. but flames um, shooting up everywhere. And uh, I hope I did him justice on the caricature. If not, he may make me disappear on that. But um, he's a, it, was, it was a very good interview and his place didn't get burned down. But it, the flames came right up to the road across the street from it. And he did get, he, you know, he went down the mountain uh, and, and survived as well. I thought that, like I said, the, the Bob Sweeney, Stephanie Sweeney story, and, and, and I think I did include that drawing. Uh, that's probably the one I'm most proud of, not because the drawing's super great, but the story behind it. Um, and this was this quote. He said, we just said a prayer for thankfulness that we still had each other, that we still had the means to move forward and to make a better path forward out of this. And that was a direct quote that he said in his, um, in his interview. And his son Stanton was an Eagle Scout, uh, just a great guy. He's, he's a student up at UT now. And so, like I said, I had watched Bob's story. And I mean, you talk about, seriously, I challenge everybody who's watching this right now to go and watch Bob's story. You will literally want to live a better life after you listen to him and his optimism and his faith and the strength that he showed. And, you know, here he passes away. And so I reach out to Stanton. I was like, hey, Stanton, you don't know me from Adam. Um, I'm working on this project. And I was incredibly moved by both your mother and your father. And I just wanted to let you know how much your dad's life meant to me. Um, even though I'm a total stranger. And he said, oh, thank you, Mr. Ramsey. I appreciate that. And he said, let me show you this picture that I took of him praying on the ashes. And he had mentioned it in the actual, you know, like I said, in his testimony, but I couldn't even, ever imagine that. And it was just, and I tried to capture it the best I could because I felt like that Bob's life was, was worth it. And um, Danny, you talk about drawing digitally. I switched over to the iPad with Procreate about three years ago to do my editorial cartoons just because I'm on the road a lot. It's just easier. But I mean, I've been doing pen and ink my whole life. You know, that's kind of for an editorial cartoonist. But it was really weird because there were so many different effects like the flames and stuff like that. I know I could have done better digitally, uh, but I was trying to recreate them you know, in with just crayons and everything else. The one that cracks me up the most, though, I did one of the smoke in downtown um, Gatlinburg. And the picture that I had to use as a reference, um, you know, you can see the smoke and everything looks kind of yellow. So I'm sitting there making it kind of yellow. And it's like, well, that doesn't really look right. That so I went out in the garage of my drawing and got a can of silver <laughs> and sprayed it all over the top of the drawing. And I said, if I screw this up, I'm going to cry like a baby. But it turned out to actually look pretty cool, and it, it kind of looked like what it was going to do. So it was, I felt like that my, my multimedia <laughs> approach to this was, uh, was pretty, um, you know, it's almost hilarious. I felt like I was back in kindergarten again, calling around with crayons and stuff on the process. How long did it take y'all to do the drawings on that? Because I'm like I said, I, I got a late start to it, but once I got started, it, you know, I mean, it was an obsession with me. I'd be working late in the middle of the night doing these drawings. And I, you know, I mean, once I got cranked on it, it didn't seem like I wanted to stop. Yeah. I think the biggest challenge, like you, it's funny listening to you talk about not overworking the smoke. I mean, two things that are really hard to draw and paint fire and smoke. Right. And to yeah. make them feel like real, like they have dimension. Yeah, so I think for me, it was like a challenge not to overwork some of the pieces. I wish I had included this one. I did this one um, that was a before and after because I was also interested in how like fire changes the ecosystem and like the scientists who are studying the effects of it. And that one, I think I remember, I think I did that one more than once to get the fire, the flames right and the smoke and make yeah. it feel right. Um, but yeah, it is a little scarier to do it on the, on board rather than doing it um, digitally. But I, as is everybody in the land, you know, in the time of COVID, I've spent so much time looking at a screen. I just really wanted to try to do the pieces by hand and whatever happened that I didn't plan was sort of a happy accident, maybe that added to the, the composition or the color. So, yeah, but once, like you said, once you got into them, it was, uh, it was, it went pretty well. It went pretty easy. You know, once you figured out what the images were going to be. 
Um, but yeah, it was like in the zone, you know, you're sort of in that headspace after listening to those interviews for so many hours. Danny, also, I, I can't remember if you said this or Danny said this, but you worry that you're give, you're doing justice to the person's mm-hmm. personal mm-hmm. history and story. So you feel like a, a pressure to get it right, I guess. Yeah, yeah I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Jack Davison's name out there real quick. Um, just because one thing about Jack, when he would do caricatures, he would always do really hone in on the main caricature and then all the other stuff was really loose in the background and on that. And so some of the people's caricatures, I really tried to hit pretty hard, pretty carefully and close and other ones. I'm just kind of like, nah, <laughs> just, I'll just make it, I'll just make it real light, you know, depending on what time it was and, and so forth on that. But yeah, you know, I mean, I don't know about y'all, but when I, by the time I got done drawing them, I'm like, I want to meet some of these people. I really do. I mean, I feel like I know them and I'm family and all this kind of crazy stuff. And, that's what I get for watching so much television, I guess. You know, one thing I one thing I did was I uh, I started out and did black and white thumbnail sketches of all of all of them before I started doing any finished pieces. And in fact, I had I had these thumbnails out, and that was uh, about the time Paige had emailed some preliminaries, and I had one the one of that you had Paige with all the cars lined up. I had uh-huh. one that almost looked exactly like that. And I thought, okay, I can't do that one now. <laughs> oh, I messed you up. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you beat me to it. But no, yours, you did a, a wonderful job on that. But, um, but yeah, I did, I worked out all the sketches first and then just kind of started one by one going in and tried to complete uh, the color version and then moved on to the next one. I did the same thing and I was really hoping I wouldn't mess up. Like if I got a black and white composition, I really liked, I was hoping I wouldn't mess it up when I started trying to paint it. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. I tried to capture fire by setting one of them on fire, but I decided that was not, <laughs> that was, not, that was probably not a good long-term strategy for all of them. That would not definitely on that. But um, yeah, it, like I said, it was, um, it was, a, it was just a fun project just because, I mean, I, I created, artificially some real serious deadline pressure on me. But I mean, I, I guess if I had it to do over again, I wish I could take about nine months to just give each drawing the justice. I've each story, the justice it deserved, not the drawing itself, but they were just so incredible. Was there anything that you learned out of the, I mean, obviously we learned a lot about the fire that we didn't know. Was there anything that just jumped out at y'all that you learned that you said, no, I I never heard this. I, this is new to me or anything like that. You just, I guess I just, you just wouldn't think a fire that big could happen in that area. Yeah. But I mean, that's just, I don't know. It's just hard to believe. I know when I was listening to some of the, um, you're listening to these interviews and people are talking about it so calmly now and they have some distance on the experience. And, and I was like, I, so I, after I heard some of the interviews, I went, you guys probably did this too. I went online and looked up like photos from, you know, uh, the newspaper and TV and magazine, like all the news coverage, just to see some of these specific places um, in the moment when they were, you know, when they were burning and things. And I was just sort of shocked at what I, what I saw. Um, Just the scale of the fire. It was, it was hard to get your head around it. Yeah. I think for me, I just, um, the way it caught everybody by surprise, just, yeah. Make me think about maybe being a little more prepared <laughs> yeah. for the unexpected. I mean, you know, um, one of the drawings that I did was uh, I took from a, a researcher who talked about she she researches and studies businesses uh, uh, after um, disasters. Mm-hmm. And she was talking about how none of the businesses had any kind of natural disaster plan that if it was anything, it was a, a, an unused manual on a shelf and that was it. So I think that's one thing that's probably changed in that community now, but I think that's a lesson for all of us just to um, maybe spend a little time um, thinking ahead of time, just to prepare for, for the unexpected, the best that you can. Yeah. My, my wife and I, when we lived in Texas, we had to evacuate like immediately from a flood. And I just remember going around trying to pick out stuff that was important, (laughs) you know, like Paige was talking about earlier about the pictures and everything else. And, you know, we, we were very fortunate our house survived. Most of our neighborhood did not from the flood, but that said, you know, that was one of the things that, you know, there were people that you'd listen to and they had like a little box, you know, of stuff and they were able to put it in the car and they were able to get out that. But 
you're right. I think everybody, it seemed like if you had a plan, it wasn't a good plan. And, you know, even from the city down to the national park, down to individuals. And, and I think the thing that struck me about this, and it, it did remind me the same one about Katrina was that the very richest and the very poorest suffered equally on this fire. It just, it, see, it showed no mercy. It didn't just hit, you know, this section of town or the back, you know, it literally, and how downtown did not burn is beyond me. It's literally like the fire just did this and went around it, you know? And, and so that, and that was kind of what I walked away from. I mean, walked away from it with uh, number two and Dolly Parton should be queen of the world. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, Dolly, you know, uh, you know, as we're recording this right now, she just announced she's going to pay, you know, for any of her workers to go to college. You know, it's like, OK, what else is she going to do? Is she going to cure cancer next year? I mean, she's, <laughs> she's amazing. But her help and, and the fact that I think so many people around the country have had wonderful experiences in the Smoky Mountains. I think that helped the area a lot, too, because it, that's what caused everybody to say, oh, I'm going to send in a check to help um the people of the Smokies. And I think that that goodwill toward the area helped them recover too. I, I I'm totally the mountain strong thing is nothing but the truth. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, is there, like I said, was there any other thoughts? We'll, we'll open it up here in just a few uh, minutes for some questions from the audience. We'd love, I saw those hearts come up for Dolly Parton. I'm just going to every three minutes, I'm just going to say Dolly Parton and then we'll, we'll get lots of, uh, <laughs> lots of love on the video, but I'd, like I said, I hope someday I get to meet her and just say, you are amazing. Thank you so much. What you did for, you know, even though I don't live there, my, my, my area, my, my people, you know, I, I love that on there. Um, I'm trying to see what, what else I, on this I need to cover. I think I got, like I said, you know, when you got asked to do this, um, did you, did you anticipate that this project would have the impact that it did on your lives? No, I, I didn't really know. Um, I didn't really know what to expect. Um, you know, only only when I started watching and listening and realizing, you know, this is not just a story that I'm going to hear about, but seeing the actual person telling this story about their own family and their own property and uh, their own experience, uh, it became way more real than I guess what I was expecting. So it was. Uh, it was riveting in, in that way. It was heartbreaking to hear some of the stories, but also, uh, like I said earlier, uh, very hopeful to see their people's mm -hmm. attitudes and their resilience. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think the project was initially really like intimidating. Um, just like I said, because you, you are afraid you aren't going to do the stories justice or, mm -hmm. um, you know, do enough, I guess. Um, but, um, I don't know. I walked away feeling like it, it is like, I think, uh, Marshall, you said you feel like, you know, these people now, like you like, it was like you're sitting in the living room, listening to them talk about their personal experiences and personal stories. Anyway, you wanted to reach through the camera and like give a few of them a hug. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I think the thing that, and I'm, I'm worried about this to this day. And I, and I know there's, there were a couple different videos. There was one of one of the teachers that teaches at one of the elementary schools talking about, uh, he's the same guy that had the knife, you know, that was cutting the tree and his, I thought his interview was really good. And he had like, you know, you would watch these interviews, they'd be an hour long and there would be two or three little diamonds right in the middle of it. One of them was obviously the next story, which I thought was a brilliant story. And the other was, he'd be teaching a class and his kids just out of nowhere would just start crying. Aww. And, you know, the, the PTSD that the kids suffered and, you know, and so it, it'll be fascinating to see. And we had one of the, a, a sociologist and a counselor talking about that too, of, of some of the ramifications. It'll be interesting to see what the long-term consequences, not only of the environment, of the people too, of that area. Um, I, the last time, I guess it's been two years since I've been up, you know, this, this little thing called the pandemic kind of slowed us down a little bit yeah. on travel um, is probably why we're not meeting on a stage right now talking about this, to be honest with you. But I, I got to say, um, I've been really impressed 
at the community. I think about like, not to give a shout out to Alamo Steakhouse. I just remember this story where he had had um, it, like interruption insurance. So he was able to continue to pay his, his uh, employees through the shutdown and as they rebuilt and that, that Alamo is not real far away from our cabin. So I was like, that one, that one kind of hit hard. And then too, um, you know, you start hearing, you know, the individual stories and so forth. So like I said, I just got into watching it and, and um, you know, because you watch a news story like the Gatlinburg fire on the national news and you hear about it for two days and, and you don't hear about what happens for the next six months to a year to four years after that. And I, I felt like that these oral histories really helped me understand that that much more. And I want to give a quick shout out to the UT library folks um, who have been absolutely delightful and wonderful to work with. On yeah, this definitely. I, I second that. So. I was going to say, Marshall, just to, to uh, echo something, a person's question that I see in the comments wondering about whose idea was it to have this artist archivist collaboration? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, well, I don't know the answer. So <laughs> I, I don't know the answer either, but I remember I said to uh, the folks we're working with at UT that uh, whoever's idea was was kind of genius because um, images give people an entry point, right, to then take it a step further and 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 learn about all these oral histories. So I don't know. I thought it was I thought it was a great way to make this this huge library of, of interviews. Uh, feel accessible and approachable. Uh, it just gave, I think it'll give people an entry point. Yeah. Um, I hope that's what it does anyway. Yeah. I think, uh, well, I guess just generally credit goes to Stephen Smith and his staff. I mean, that's yeah. really where the, the, uh, the idea came from. And I, like you, I'm, I was, uh, I thought it was really innovative. Uh, I, I yeah. really, uh, un, I'd never seen or heard anybody do that to have cartoonists, illustrators to come in and help depict uh, an event like that. Yeah. I've, you know, I've actually talked to my boss with my day job. I'm going to start doing um, some like storytelling, graphic storytelling like that around Mississippi because I just fell in love with the whole concept of, of, of creating, taking that research. It's not, it's a lot different than just doing an editorial cartoon, which is a one and done and you're gone. I like telling that narrative long-term story. So um, I thought it was just a brilliant idea and I can't wait to see all of our work together in a show because, uh, I mean, it, like I said, I think the combination of all of our work together is really going to hit about every angle on this. And it's going to be really cool to see it in one piece and big, too. Um, John B's got a really nice question here. Were there any scenes or images that you would have liked to capture but couldn't or drawings that failed? Well, all my drawings failed. I mean, that, that's <laughs> right there. <laughs> I think um, I was trying to capture I was trying to do in the image I was trying to do the before and after. Um, I was trying to get at what it feels like to be like in a stand of timber after mm. a blaze that hot has gone through and, and what's left are what they call the standing dead. It's, yeah. you know, and, and I just, I couldn't quite get that to look the way it felt to me, or, you know, I couldn't quite capture the loss of that sort of scene, that sort of loss of ecosystem. But, um, so that was kind of a fail and I had to sort of pivot and do a different approach. Um, I think also I tried to do, I'm not as good at caricatures as you are, um, Marshall. And I think initially I had tried to do some drawings of the actual people doing the interviews. And then I sort of aborted that and decided to focus more on their sort of outward facing experience of the things they were talking about rather than them personally. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that was, another thing I learned. Yeah. I think Russell's probably going to agree that I probably didn't get his caricature down real well <laughs> on that. Uh, but, but, but on that, you know, what I ended up doing on drawing, because I, I joke that I'm living in Mississippi, I've gotten really good at drawing, you know, debris, you know, from hurricanes yeah. and tornadoes and all the things that we get hit with down here. You are really good at that. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, like I said, you know, I'm, I, I'm, that's my forte. Yay. You know, but um, I wish I didn't know how to do that. But I, what I, how I approached it was I would get really thin pins for the stuff up close, 
you know, didn't make it super black or I would make it black. And then I would dip pencil for anything off in the distance and I would light it. And then I would take pencil and just kind of smear it over the top of it with my fingers to kind of give it a smoky haze look on that. And so I think I succeeded in, in a, but there's two or three of the drawings I was kind of happy with how they turned out like that. Uh, I didn't resort to spray paint on all of them. So um, that one, that one was, I'm not quite sure was a success, but it was still fun to try. So <laughs> on that, but but that was the thing. It was it was all about storytelling, and it was just trying to figure out what was the best way to be able to to um, tell. Let's see, yeah, I I um, usually if if there was something I couldn't quite depict, I kind of figured that out in the sketch stage that that, that angle or showing that was not going to work. Yeah. Um, and as far as showing caricatures of people, I avoided that from the beginning. But I did have one caricature. And that's Topper the Cat. I did do that from a, an actual photo of Topper the Cat. Topper yeah. ended up being a local celebrity and had his own Facebook page for a while after that. So there were some photos on there I was able to look at. Yeah, I really love that drawing. Oh, that was great. I, like I said, I want to meet Topper the Cat now after seeing your drawing. So I think Topper may have passed away a couple of years Aww. ago. Well, not not thanks, from his Danny. injuries, but sorry. Yeah. Oh, thanks, man. <laughs> we were going great, and then you had to drop that. <laughs> Okay, well, now that everybody's just signed off because they're sad, <laughs> I, I tell you also too. And like I said, I, I, you know, I love the UT Library folks; they're just great. I really and Paige, you know, everybody, you got to understand. Everywhere Paige has been, I've been there about six months after she has in her career. You know, <laughs> I'm looking forward to my chance to work at Schultz Enterprise. That one had to come. Past yet. I guess I better, better work on my art skills a little bit, but. Um, no, I lived in Atlanta. She was in Atlanta. I was at UT. She was at T. Charlie Daniels. It is kind of funny. School. It is kind of it funny. Kind of, it was like following each like other around. Stalker. Yeah, I'm a stalker. So, but I knew you, right? And I've interviewed you, and it's been yeah. fun. And I came up for the uh, UT Galleries had a wonderful art exhibit of uh, Paige's work, and then they had Danny's work up. And so I drove up on Friday and got to meet Danny. And uh, I really regret, Danny, that I did not meet you about 30 years ago. Um, it's just, it was well, really you know, it's great. funny. Marshall, I've, I've seen your work for so long, and I told Jennifer this the other day. I said, you know, I've always known at some point I will be friends with Marshall Ramsey. So but for some reason, I've always thought that we would eventually know each other. So I'm glad we finally met. I hope it didn't turn out to be a huge disappointment, no, you know, no. <laughs> kind of like getting socks for Christmas or something. I just wouldn't <laughs> want to do that to you. Um, and, and everybody, too, you need to understand that Danny's wife went to the same high school as my wife. So it's just it's completely two degrees of separation amongst the three of us. So. That's right. Yeah. This was fun. Yeah. Very Danny fun. was the Danny was the guy that I looked up to when I was at UT because he was one class ahead of me and he seemed to have figured it all out. And his like I was so envious of how great an illustrator you were. So it was super fun to get to work on this project with you after all these years. You know what it scares me that some of my cartoons that I did at UT are still in the UT library and someday I'm gonna find them. So Steve, you better hide them because I don't want anybody to see them. <laughs> Uh, hey, I heard there were a couple of questions about how the project originated. Um, I think yes. everything, like every good idea, it's really a team. Um, and really credit goes to the National Endowment for the Arts when we saw the Our, Our Town program as we were beginning to think about collecting oral histories and looking for grant opportunities. We thought, hey, wouldn't it be neat to see if we could engage our artists some way with these oral history interviews to see you know, again, um, the creativity that could come from it. And also just as another creative way of documenting such an important historic event. So really, I think credit should go to the National Endowment for the Arts. So the taxpayers, you you can feel good about this. So and um, and the book that is coming out with help of the UT Press will be available later this spring, which will collect all of the art that you've seen tonight and many other images by these great artists, plus two special images from uh, Charlie Daniel. Oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be sitting here right now if it weren't for Charlie Daniel. So I got to, it's, it's always good to give him love. Kayla Clark had a question here. Will you create a Mountain Strong series showing how Gatlinburg and the survivors rebuilt after the community? I think I touched on that on a few of my drawings a little bit. Um, in fact, um, hang on. I have it written right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, but 
I mean, I thought that was just great. It was such a great rallying cry. And, uh, you know, everybody kind of fell. And I was it the school superintendent, I believe, was who said that I, originally. And I can't remember his name. But, um, yeah, I think that Gatlinburg's grit and resilience is something that we all should. And, and you know, people of faith really came together and lifted everybody up. And it was, a, you know, it, we live in a cynical time now. And so it's incredibly um, comforting to know that when push comes to shove, that we can we can come together and help each other. Agreed. Yeah, I'll quit preaching now. <laughs> well, I'll just do a quick shout out to David Dodson with um, the Dollywood Foundation. He gave he and his uh, colleagues gave a great interview that's in the archive about the Mountain Strong um, effort and Dolly's involvement, and also very generously donated the archive that they put together documenting their activities so he's just you know one of many people who were so generous with their time and telling us their stories definitely definitely well um i don't i mean is there anything that i have not touched on to the panelists uh about this project i mean i feel like we you know, I, we all sat in horror together probably at the same time watching this. We all love the Smokies because we probably, when we were in school, I don't know about you, I would I would go up to Cades Cove and go run just on Tuesday, Thursdays when I didn't have classes. I mean, it was just always my escape route yep. when I was in college. And to see some place you love like that in peril um, is, is, is hard. And um, but it just was fun. Not fun. It was just really meaningful and important to get to work on this project, and I'm really thankful, Steve, that that, that every that you asked me. This was just a huge honor. Yeah, same. Well, thanks to each of you. It was really so inspiring when each of you said yes. So it just <laughs> it was really wonderful. Was it inspiring when I missed my deadline? <laughs> I, Marshall, I never thought you missed your deadline. I knew we had money in the bank with you. You'll, okay. you'll always come through. <laughs> Yeah, I've never missed one, but boy, I kind of definitely <laughs> stretched that one pretty, I kind of like my pants after the pandemic. It just was a, it was a tough one, but I got it done. So. <laughs> well, I think that wraps us up and I just want to thank our panelists and uh, um, Danny and Paige and Marshall. Uh, just, it's been great to hear from you this evening and thank you also for, for giving so much of your time to help, you know, interpret and express this uh this the history of this important event and to help commemorate and remember those who suffered um and who lost but but you know with every story of loss there are stories of resilience and i think that you all have helped us see that so thank you so much thank well, you, thank you. and thank you marshall for moderating oh yeah. good no job problem. as they say uh, my pleasure but i can't remember who says that but anyway <laughs> <my pleasure. laughs>